Good afternoon and welcome to yet another Streaming Media West Connect panel. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the conference chair for Streaming Media West Connect. This is our sixth virtual conference. And before every one of these, I've said, we'll see you in person next time. I'm not going to say that this time because perhaps I've jinxed it. I don't think that's actually the case, but I still won't say it. We are, however, planning to be in Boston for Streaming Media East in May of 2022, May 24th and 25th, to be precise, and uh, save the date. Go to the streamingmedia.com forward slash East website for more information soon, and we'll be opening up the call for speakers for both that event and our Streaming Media Connect in February. We've got one more virtual event coming up. More details on that to come. Before we jump into our discussion on the future of monetization, I just have a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions for any of our panelists, please put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. The chat will be open, the chat is open, but it's easier for us to keep track of the questions if they go in the Q&A tab. Also, we do have a live transcript running. Uh, if you want to turn that off on your own screen, you can go to the bottom of your window, click on live transcript, and then click disable transcript. Finally, just for being here, you're entered into a drawing to win an Amazon gift card, a $50 gift card. We'll announce the winner at the end of the panel. I'd also like to thank our diamond sponsors, Signiant, Video Guys, Limelight, and Conviva. And we have a pre-roll, speaking of monetization, from them right now. Bill, roll it. In this era of streaming video, we are pioneers, helping make your stories more vibrant. Conviva lives in billions of apps on devices all over the world, measuring trillions of data points each day to provide real-time insights for your content, ads, and social. Conviva. Every stream, every screen, every second. VideoGuys.com is your source for live production gear, and we can help you start streaming today. Reach a wider audience and tell your story using equipment like the RGB Link Mini Family of four HDMI mixers, YOLO Live YOLO Box, Olin One touchscreen mixers, streamers, and recorders, and PTZ cameras and controllers, perfect for productions of all sizes without a large production crew. Go to VideoGuys.com or call us at 800-323-2325 for help and start streaming today. In this era of streaming video, we are. All right. Thanks again to those diamond sponsors. And also thank you to the sponsor of this panel, Amagi and Mike Woods from Amagi will be among our six panelists plus moderator. And so I don't want to take up any more of your time. And with that, I would like to introduce our panel moderated by Nadine Krefitz. So everyone join us on camera. Nadine, how are you? I'm wonderful. How about you? Outstanding. Looking forward to it. It is not to raining here today, so I'm very happy. I'm in Seattle. Ah, in but we've got a... it's cold, but it always is. So yeah, I know. Winter. Um, now what's great is that 
we have a whole bunch of people here from different places, but also different business models. And we're going to talk monetization. So I'm going to just get people to introduce their company and their business model. And that's obviously for the media companies. Now I'm going to go with Damien first. Damien, why don't you tell us a little bit about Beverly? Yes, thank you so much for having me back. My name is Damien Pelliccioni. I'm the CEO and one of four fabulous co-founders of Reverie, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, Reverie is the market leader and world's first LGBTQ global streaming destination platform. Uh, we coin ourselves as a tribrid of fast channels, AVOD, and subscription video on demand. Okay, wow, we got a lot there. Um, okay, I'll step on over to Gene. Gene, why don't you give us oh, yeah, a little bit of background? My name is Gene Powell with Shao Factory. Um, we're an independent entertainment company. I mean, we basically dabble in every area from new theatrical film releases to uh, library streaming products. We also have our own branded services. So we have um, you know, Shao Factory TV ABOD, Shao Factory TV as a subscription service. And then we have uh, five fast channels that we're currently operating, Shao Factory TV, um, the Johnny Carson TV channel or Johnny Carson TV, the Carol Burnett Show can channel, Mystery Science Theater 3000 channel, and then finally a channel called Tokushatsu, which is a play uh -huh. on the word tokusatsu, which represents a genre of programming that if you think Power Rangers and Godzilla, um, those are the two types of programs that sort of constitute the, the tokusatsu genre. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot to actually kind of keep together because we're going to go back to business models later so i've got a lot of questions for you but daniel why don't you tell us again you've got a variety of business models what is synodon and what do you do absolutely um so uh i'm daniel schneider uh cp of revenue at, at synodyme and um we're a uh, streaming focused company um, with tens of thousands of, uh, you know, videos, assets that we distribute to a wide variety of uh, distribution partners um, on a a la carte basis, on a SVOD basis, on an AVOD basis. And then we have also about, you know, 22 um, streaming channels um, live in market. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I think like the, the conversation about fast, linear and, and model is a, is a really good, uh, uh, will be really uh, interesting here. And, you know, we can uh, talk, uh, talk uh, have a good conversation about it. I, you know, it's, and, and we, we can even define that in a little bit, but I'm going to get Chris on to tell us. I've, I've hit up all the media people first. Chris, you're the last one. Tell us about you and Redbox. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Nadine. So uh, I'm the GM of, of Redbox On Demand. Um, um, I'm sure uh, most people would know us, at least initially, as the, as the uh, large and uh, very well distributed uh, kiosk business for DVDs uh, and Blu-rays, which, by the way, we still have 41,000 kiosks around the country. Uh, I oversee our digital video efforts, which includes our transactional video store and our ad-supported services, both AVOD and Fast Channel Service. Okay. Absolutely interesting. So, and, um, you know, we got two other people that I think are going to bring a very interesting perspective. Elizabeth Parks is from Parks. Elizabeth, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Thanks, Nadine. And thank you for the invitation to participate. So I'm Elizabeth Parks, the president of Parks Associates. We are a market research and consulting company celebrating our 35th year in business this year. And uh, we are very closely tracking all things technology with consumers. We survey 10,000 broadband households each quarter, and we are also tracking uh, close to 400 OTT services in North America and have lots of great insights. I'm excited to be here. And so thank you for the invitation. Sure thing. Okay. And Mike is our sponsor, and I just left the last spot for a little bit of a commercial about Amagi, just a small one. Tell us about the company. Well, we, we lit off talking about rain and, and out here in Southern California, I'm in Santa Monica. We had our one, a week ago Monday, we had our one day of rain. So we had our one day of winter. We're done. We can move on. Okay, lucky you. <laughs> and sunny, so thank goodness nature is restored. Um, but it's, it's great to be part of the panel today. And from the Amagi side, what, what Amagi does, Amagi is the tech platform that powers streaming TV. And, and we, we work 
by connecting content owners, uh, people that, that create channels, uh, like, the, like Cynodyne, uh, Daniel and the team over there, great clients of ours, um, over to video services like Redbox On Demand uh, that Chris Yates works with, um, and, and provide the connective fabric that links those together and powers this whole digital-based television that we call streaming TV uh, ecosystem. And so it's, it's great. We, we're interconnected with, um, with both those sides of the market and a third side, which is the, the ad tech that, that makes a lot of the, the uh, advertising-based formats uh, available and, and uh, viable in this space. So uh, from the Imagi side, we're the tech platform, the power stream, stream TV. We work with content owners to create channels. We deliver those channels to video services where the audience can watch it. And when someone from the audience comes in and watch that, watches those that, that, that content, those channels. Um, we've got the ad tech to frame accurately, seamlessly insert ads into those video streams um, and help to monetize those. And from, from, a, from a marketplace perspective, um, we're, we're agnostic to the, the type of revenue that's being generated on the channels. We can support um, all the different formats that are out there, SVOD, TVOD, AVOD, FAST, um, whatever acronym you like for, uh, for creating your, your revenues, um, we, we can support those. And, and the great thing about what we do at Amagi is that we really help with the cost factors around building channels and doing it effectively at scale and, and providing ROIs back to our clients that really help them be effective doing things that used to cost tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in traditional broadcast. We can now do uh, dynamically in the cloud on a digital platform, gives a ton of new capabilities um, at, an, at an ROI that's probably one ten thousandth of what it used to be in the past. It's, it's an exciting space. Okay, so let's, let's in fact, dive into some numbers here. Um, we're not so much numbers, but business models. So if we've got, you know, Damien has a, what do you, you call it a tri? Tribrid. Tribrid, okay. <laughs> a tribrid. Um, does anybody here, you know, and, and we didn't kind of discuss this, but does anybody here kind of have a favorite, whether it's subscription, transaction, at AVOD, TriVOD? No, I, I, I'm going to go with, is there a favorite between one model or do, do we have to stay in like the multiple model form? Well, it depends on the nature of the content. Um, so there's actually four if you add uh, electronic sell through or TVOD to it because that okay. represents the most premium. Uh, so new releases generally fall into that category. I mean, you don't mm -hmm. want to put a new release right away out on AVOD because that monetizes the lowest. So you want to put it in places where it's going to monetize the best. And then as the uh, title gets, should I say, like, you know, maybe older or more, um, uh, more mainstream, then then you start making your way down. So, you know, EST has the highest value than video on demand rental, then it's subscription services, then it is free services. And then I would probably say at the end is the fast services because people generally um, watch fast services kind of uh, in the background. You know, you, okay. you wake up, you turn it on and you let it run in the background while you go about your day. All right. Is, is, do we have a, a contrary opinion here in the audience? Do we have Damien smiling? I'm going to go with. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I think, you know, just to echo Gene's point, a little contrarian to that is that I think it depends on the audience and the demographic. Um, and I'll give an example. You know, the way Gen Z watches is vastly different than Gen X. Right. And Gen Z only watches things like AVOD, YouTube, and fast media. They don't subscribe to things, and Elizabeth could probably give you better statistics than I can on it. Um, and so depending on the demo that you're trying to target, and the difference obviously being, is it a Reverie title or a Marvel title? Of course, Marvel is going to do amazing on TVOD or PVOD, which I love the Disney coin this year. Um, premium video on demand, so subscription within, a, you know, transactional within a subscription. But I really do think that it has to do with the generations of the target audience of the content that you're trying to hit. Okay. Yeah, I, Daniel, did, were you yeah, going to jump in? Yeah, I want to jump in. Um, so yeah, I think it totally depends on the, the audience and the content as well. Um, you know, we have an indie movie service called Fandor, which is an SVOD service. And, 
you know, is that audience really interested in, uh, you know, getting ads? Maybe um, there it's like a really passionate, loyal, dedicated audience. Um, that's really, you know, they, they really want to watch, you know, certain types of movies and they really want to have the experience, actually, the, you know, the cinema experience, in fact. And so is that uh, an audience that would be interested in ads supported? Maybe, um, but I don't know. Um, and, you know, I would say on the other side of the spectrum, there are other channels that, you know, we would just go in and launch as a fast channel and probably not touch SVOD because it just depends on what the content is and, and the, and the, uh, the who you're targeting really. I, so, yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't know if this is too contrary to Nadine, but, but I, I jump in and, and, and Please amplify. Do. <laughs> I'm just going to rip right away with it uh, and, and, and amplify around what, what uh, is going around the panel here, which is, um, I, these these aren't these aren't uh, people like to kind of hone in on a one one size solution fits all and and it's really the TV ecosystem is a big space mm -hmm. and so it's it's beneficial to start parsing it apart and think about these in terms of the dynamics that they offer to the viewer. What is the audience looking for in different segments? What are they what what is, what what powers them? What what is going to drive viewership? As particular types of content owners, you have capabilities that will bring different sorts of audiences. And finding the right way to intermix between these and bring out content that leverages the particular viewership dynamics, the audience draw dynamics of each of these is really critical. So for example, if you're Disney, you can simply take your name and stamp it on a video service, toss a whole ton of content into it and charge a monthly subscription for it and people will pay it. If you are somebody else who doesn't have the Disney name, um, that's a harder sell. And so you need to find other ways to amplify your brand. So, you know, as far as SVOD goes, if you have that big name, you, SVOD works when, when, the, when a significant number of consumers will just search out your service and pay you money for it. Um, but you have to have that brand recognition or a specific enough niche that you will get audience to hunt you down and find you. And then um, there's, there's other, other formats that have, have risen up, which is, um, being able to aggregate up vast amounts of content, which Tubi went out and hoovered up lots of, of, of non, you know, licensable, uh, rev shareable content that was sitting on the shelves and bring it into a great streaming platform. And now you've got enough content in one place that people will go watch because they can kind of find whatever they want. Um, and, and, and the fast channels have really come out of this space where linear television offers some advantages which is if you don't have a big brand, you can link together things and make it appealing and channel up, channel down is a really powerful audience metaphor. People can come into these services, go channel up, go channel down, know instantly, do I, do I wanna watch this channel? Do I not hone in on it? And then, and then pick out um, a channel and sit there and lie back and watch it. Um, so it, it's, it's finding the right mode. If you're, if you're Redbox and you have all of the, the, the studio integrations all the studio relationships to get that first run content during that that rental period then tvod is is powerful for you um so you know finding finding the right ways to mix your content your strengths as a as a as a publisher as a streaming service and interplay between these effectively i think is the key to making the market it's not a one-size-fits-all solution it's finding what resonates with your audience what resonates with your viewership and then mixing and matching those together to make a, a good revenue base Okay. No, I, in fact, I, I think at least we could probably all agree on the fact that there's definitely a variety of, of viewer types. I want to go to Elizabeth next because Elizabeth's got some of the insight behind this. But Elizabeth, when you look at trends, you know, and you've been doing this for quite a while, what are some of the things you're seeing about how people prefer to buy or obtain content? Sure. Uh, well, it's certainly a fragmented market, so I'd agree with everything that Mike said. Um, there's a lot of different options for consumers, and I think the OTT service providers have the name of the game as choice and personalization. So, um, you know, 72% of all broadband households are using multi-platforms, um, different devices, along with the television to access their content. And our research certainly shows that across the you know, AVOD, TVOD, SVOD, uh, the, the niche content continues to be about a third of what consumers are viewing overall. So there are these broad based foundational services, the big three, or it could be the top five now. 
and we will be releasing our top 10 OTT services soon uh, to reveal some of those new numbers, but certainly see the niche services as um, becoming a piece of the big pie for OTT and consumers are gonna to look to pick and choose and build and, and continue with service stacking. Um, so we'll anticipate some potential acquisitions coming in the next three, six, nine, 12 months as that bundled service is really taking hold and the experimentation continues by some of the you know, major players with the big box that can come in and, and really impact the market. Okay. Now, you know, I, I think one of the things that's really fascinating is I was looking at some additional research where they had the list of the top 10, but it was for the Gen X, uh, not sorry, Gen X, Millennial, and, and uh, the viewers were essentially looking at things that were a combination. And so, which is great for, especially for a lot of the people on this panel, but what I want to do is figure out, you know, if you have a... Uh, content or a brand and you are licensing it out, what's better for you? I mean, Damien, you said to me earlier when we were doing planning that there's a number of ways people find you, but what's the top way people do? Oh, by far, it's our Samsung TV Plus channel, which is now in five territories across the globe with Samsung. Mm -hmm. And it's our Roku channel, not our Roku app. Those are the top two places if we're talking about third party where people are engaging or discovering every live fast channels. Right. Um, if they're doing our direct to consumer, which feels like a separate business into itself, our DTC apps powered by Brightcove, um, you know, they're finding us through our marketing efforts, whether that is through social or SEO um, or just all of our amazing earned media in our press. Um, you know, we're constantly being written about probably like once or twice a week whether it's a trade paper or a consumer-based publication. Okay. Chris, I'm going to pick on you since I don't think we've heard from you yet. And I'm not sure this is the right question for you, though. So why don't we uh, focus in on running the business? You know, there's the content and there's the marketing side of the business. Mm -hmm. Where do you think... If, if you were going to create another business today, we're going to have create an imaginary business since it's not yours. You know, how would you start the business? What would you focus on? Uh, you know, that's a good question. You know, it's that you, you can't just do focus on one and, and not the other. I mean, the, the, the reality is, you know, you, your customers need to, you need to have great content. You need to have a phenomenal user experience that if you can get a customer to either download your app or come to your service, um, that they actually find something they want to watch and they enjoy it and they come back again. Um, so you need great content, a great user experience. Marketing is, is fundamental. I mean, with Redbox, we have, you know, 40 million people who use Redbox every year in the US. So we have a really, really nice platform from which to, to build services around. If you didn't have that, it can get tricky, but you know, we're fortunate enough to have, you know, a, a, actually a really loyal fan fan base or customer base that, you know, they 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 come to us for a variety of things. Um, the the one thing that I would add though that that off you know, I wouldn't say often gets gets left out, but is in some ways more important than any of them is distribution. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be on all the major devices or or as many of them as you can within reason obviously looking at your technology and, and resource constraints. Because um, if, frankly, if you're not on Roku, what is that, 53 million or so accounts, you know, on Roku alone? Um, you know, if you're not on that, you're, you're missing out on a massive chunk of the market. So, you know, great content and great marketing and a, and a phenomenal experience are really important, but you've got to get it in front, of, in front of a customer's eyes. And that means being on smart TVs and set-top boxes, um, as well as obviously your traditional mobile and web. But you know, for us, it's all about the 10 foot experience and those, those smart devices. Okay. And what about the rest of you in terms of the smart TV and the distribution? I mean, to me, I, I, you know, I hear what Chris is saying about you have to be on everything and you need to be able to support, but say you're running this imaginary business, so it's not one of yours, but you know, what if you can't do everything? What's the best strategy for you if you're going to run the business? You know, Gene, what you know, you're you're thinking imaginary business. What would you do? Well, I mean, if I had my pick, it would be all of the 
top popular platform. So smart TV, it was an area, honestly, I uh, was surprising in terms of how well they are doing. But then if you, um, you know, if you, if you think about it, it's like, it shouldn't be surprising because it's so easy that you can get a TV and out of the box connected to the internet and then you have access to all this content. You don't have to buy a stick. You don't have to plug in a set top box or anything like that. Um, you know, outside of that, it's, it's the big platform. So Roku, Amazon Fire, um, Android and, and Apple TV. Um, and I think if you were to just stop there, you'd probably get 80 to 90% of the market right there. Okay, very good. In fact, our business is doing well in that sense. Well, Damien, what were you gonna say? I'm gonna say, I'm like, but you really have to, um, I think separate like third party as well as direct to consumer, right? Mm -hmm. So direct consumer being that you are managing and you're operating that whole user experience and you own or at least have the most access of ownership to the tech stack. But then, you know, playing out on Fast and Avod with services like Frequency and Amagi and Zumo to be able to reach the greatest possible audience, which um, like they were saying before, Samsung and Roku channel, Roku channel being, you know, such a big beast in the market. And, you know, Reverie exists on over 50 platforms, um, only five of which are, are owned and operated by us, right? Our direct to consumer. Those mm -hmm. 45 are essentially the places where we're getting the most point of discovery and monetizing at a much higher field because we don't have the Disney or the Redbox yet, like marketing dollars to get in there. But, you know, eventually we'll get there. I mean, does it make sense? Sorry, I was going to say, does it make sense for the owned and operated to actually be in the running? I mean, in that if you're getting all this business elsewhere elizabeth do you kind of have any insight into that where well i was just going to add in the data point that we have that uh, nearly 30 percent of uh, new ott subscriptions are coming from the connected tv platform so Definitely. you know the tv has continued to be a central role um, for consumers and i mean when you see Comcast and Amazon jumping in with their own hardware plus the service, it's very clear where that's going. Uh, so I think depending on the size of the OTT service and the amount of resources, you know, money and the content, you know, then you're making decisions over where you're going to go. And uh, as Jean, uh, Jean said, you know, you want to be everywhere if you can, but many companies, you know, they have to pick and choose where, where their resources are, are utilized. Absolutely. Um, and sorry, Damien, uh, Daniel, <laughs> were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add this. So that's interesting to see at the research level, because I think like that kind of confirms what we're seeing on the ground, um, whereas like the third party distribution has really like picked up significantly in the last few years. Um, you know, there's all these aggregation hubs, Roku, the Roku channel, um, Amazon, Comcast, like there's, there's, a, there's a lot. And, you know, I think O&O is and can be important, but even for SVOD, where it's like a dedicated subscription for content, third-party distribution is 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 very 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 you know important. Um, and um, I mean, we we definitely see that on the the, the you know the ad-supported side because you know the more people the, the more people you can reach, the more impression, the more you know the more revenue. But um, on the SVOD side, we're seeing that too. It's funny because our SVOD service on third party like Comcast, Cox, Amazon channels is 30% higher than our direct consumer because we're not marketing there. We just exist. And as long as we're optimized correctly with search and discovery in those each of those platforms, we're getting, you know, quarter over quarter more subscription through these third parties. That's impressive. I mean, yeah. it's not only impressive, but it, it seems like smart business sense to, to be able to do that. Um, now, I've got a huge amount of questions in the audience. Let's see if we can pick one of them. Um, let's see. Over the past 25 years, we've seen a migration of niche sports, starting with ESPN to OLN versus to dot, dot, dot. How do you see where the space is at right now and the opportunities? So essentially, we're looking at niche sports here which isn't necessarily an area that I think any of us are in, are we? Um, well, I, 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 can, I can jump in on that. Maybe. Sure, yeah. From, from the Amagi platform, we power a lot. We power over 1,200 channels in the space. And we, we, we've got a, a viewpoint kind of across a, a wide array of things that we see out there. And, and as, we, as we look across the ecosystem and, and evaluate what's happening in, in streaming TV and this, 
digitally based version of television that, that lets us do new cool things in it. One of the things is that is that from the from the video service side, we can now we can now launch um, thousands of parallel channels, billions, almost infinite channels, because these are these are no longer being being wired down the cable pipes and taking up each one taking up bandwidth. Now we've freed the the, the channels of the proprietary proprietary pipelines and, and are streaming them over the open internet. So we can laterally scale the ecosystem essentially to infinity. So every type of format out there is capable of now being delivered as a stream to viewers. And then from the video server side, it's about creating an experience that, that, that viewers can find the content that they want effectively. And that discovery is, is really key and a big challenge out there. But I, I, I talk about um, you know, the, the three horsemen, if you will, of the streaming apocalypse are news, sports, and live events. You know, these, these are the pillars that, that make people come for uh, for, for appointment viewing. These are the things that you can't do on SVOD. You can't, you can't record those and make them super appealing later on. Sure, there's reruns. There's, there's particular fans will come back for, for replays. But those are, these are the, the, the pinnacles of appointment viewing, and you want to experience those live. And so these, these are, I, I believe these are important factors moving forward on um, niches that have massive, you know, that, that have sizable, hyper attentive viewers are going to do well, particularly as the video services evolve in the space, build out the discovery tools and really make this viewership available. So things like, like cycling, there's a rabid fan base of cycling. Um, that, that's something that, that, has, that likely has legs. And as we expand out the service and can, can, uh, can, can build out on what Elizabeth talked about with choice and personalization and make those really active and available into the viewer base, into the audience, then you can you can set those up and, and be able to tune into those cycling events that you want to see um, out, out of the TV set. Um, we're, we're, we're in this shift out of app stores where the owned and operated comes into play, but app stores are really only viable for a very small handful of companies. Um, those are the ones with the brand names that can drive people to go hunt down their apps. And, and people have to, 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 to work with an app, you have to be really focused. You have to really want that content. You have to go find it. You have to download it. You have to go subscribe to it and you have to activate it. And then you've got to come back and watch it again and again and again. And each time you come back to your Roku, you've got to go back and go cycle into that app. And without the brand name support behind that, without massive marketing, massive brand name, massive desire on the consumer side, individual owned and operated apps are extremely challenged. Um, and, and we're seeing the space head more into the, the YouTubeization where better search engines, better discoverability is coming into play and we'll start making the stuff available. And then you can line up on your own. You can personalize your TV experience, but in a content forward uh, format, apps are, are, are going to disappear um, outside of a few majors and we'll have a, a collective content environment. But absolutely, sports, news, live events, those are the three horsemen of the streaming apocalypse. Okay, and since we're running this imaginary service, it's good to know that we don't have to now create all these apps because we don't have <laughs> the money for it. Um, but it sounds like so if if we're if we're using a lot of distributors, um, isn't that fast, or is it something else? Am I missing something here? Well, the difference between fast and Avod is or SVOD is one is on demand and the other mm -hmm. one is actually free ad supported streaming television. So the idea is that you're watching live TV, you're being curated to with live channel experiences very much, you know, like cable. It was funny, like I was Elizabeth, since we did cable our call, I, I quote Elizabeth all the time now about like, and I, you should probably just say this, but the five major channels and how this dates back to like the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, Damien, it's a huge point. I mean, if you just go back and look at history, look at what happened on cable and the bundle yeah. ruled and then it was the skinny bundle. It's the, it's the big unbundle and then the huge rebundle coming. And I think we're really probably in the very beginning stages. Um, there's there's a lot to capture uh, there. And consumers want, want a curated experience they also want to just go buy something you know buy a service that, that they like for 499 so uh the the industry set itself up for some challenges with the ease in and out of services but also huge opportunity to give the customer the consumer what they want to watch because you know you're able to know so much more from all the data and the analytics that 
that you've got behind the services and their uh, general consumption. If if uh, if I can just add a little to that, I think it's a really it's a really good point, and, and I, I think um, one thing that that Damon you were touching on is, and maybe Nadine you were saying the same thing is. First party services are great in theory. Everyone wants to own their own app and own their own experience. I get it. We feel the same way. Uh, having said that, not everyone has the, the millions or billions of dollars to acquire those customers. And, right. you know, frankly, if, if, if you're struggling with, with a, without having a large marketing budget or, or a large, you know, kind of pop culture moment where people are going to come to your, your service, your app directly, these third party services, which by the way, you know, we are in many respects as well with a number of our services provide tremendous value. I mean, if you think about it, you know, on, on our free live TV service, which is a fast channel service, we have over 115 channels now. Only three of them are Redbox branded. So we're actually providing a service for, for these companies, both big and small, to, to essentially we're giving them a pipeline to our customers, you know, helping our customers find that great content too. And that's really valuable. And by the way, that doesn't just live just in a fast environment. Um, we've announced, and the most I can tell you is we announced to the street that, you know, we're going to be launching SVOD channels next year. Uh, we're not going to be launching a Redbox branded SVOD service. So we will be working with third parties to bring their SVOD services to our customers through the Redbox app. And granted, not everyone's going to want to do that. But for a lot of these services, not having to pay those customer acquisition costs and having access to our 40 million customers is something that a lot of, frankly, a lot of partners are going to find really interesting. I think my imaginary service wants to be on your service. So <laughs> we'll be in touch. Re reach now, out. We'll talk about it. Okay, good. Now, Mike, what about you've seen other customer trends? You know, what else kind of has, has bubbled up to the top? Well, I think all of this is, is it's, it's incredibly helpful to frame all of this in, in kind of this bigger macro context, which is uh, the, the, the tools like Amagi, um, what, we've, what we've done is we've, we've broken free the ability now to bring content in full television, high quality formats out over the open internet. And it, it's a radical shift. And so we're, we're in the middle of this shift from, from what I call traditional TV into the digitally based cloud-based tech that powers streaming TV. And, and as, we, as we look at the shift that's going on, the things that we see today, we're, we're in the middle of this, of this being sorted out, of figuring out what's happening. And I call it, we're, we're in V1 of streaming TV. So fast platforms like Samsung TV Plus, these are the first experiments in the space. These, these are the first run things. Um, you know, SVOD came out, was, was really the pioneer in the space, the first thing that we could technically do. Um, about 2017, we broke free the ability to create long running, full linear television channels. The technical capabilities really came together in about 2017. And we, 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 we created the fast channel space um, collectively across the ecosystem. We, we, we created this space. Um, and, and now we can, we can operate the cable bundle you know, fast channels like uh, Gene described ex extremely well with you buy a TV, you plug in the internet cable and you instantly have 150, 200, 250 TV channels just streaming out of the TV set. It's, um, it's a cable bundle for free uh, piped into the TV. We, we used to call this antennas. <laughs> so, I mean, are your customers coming out and saying we want to be part of the cable bundle <laughs> realistically? <laughs> and, and, so, and so this is, this is the, but, but this is great because now we can bring content out it's easily discoverable with that channel up, channel down button with looking through the TV guides. And we don't have to teach people how to use television all over again. It's a, it's a viewer format that everybody understands. Okay. And then from here, there's this outlook moving forward. This is V1. V2 and V3 and V4 are going to be ways of now intermixing all the different content formats easily together in a discover, in, you know, make it discoverable, make it easy to switch between linear and video on demand. There, there's the, these, these distinctions now start becoming arbitrary because we can break down these walls and these formats in the digital for, in the digital underpinning, that digital platform that we're building out for the future. And so now as, a, as video services evolve, if you're watching Reverie and you, and you see that, that series that you really like, well, then go into the next episode of that series. You don't have to keep watching that channel, right? 
So these, these are the, the, the crossover enterprise. You're, you can switch from linear channel, that curated live back experience. Hey, I'm tired. It's the end of the day. Got the kids to bed. Got my beer. I just want to lie back and be entertained um, and feed that content to me. So I can start with that and then go, oh, I really like this show. Give me the next episode of that and branch out. And now I'm in VOD, right? That's, we, we think of that as a separate environment today, but it's not. And then I go, I, oh. I think we think of it separate because we're all in different aspects of it. But yeah. you know, one of the things that I think about is that's the danger because we're all involved in this, is that we, we're talking about in separate areas. Now, Elizabeth, though, goes and talks to the consumers. And you know, one of the things that the consumer does is they don't think this is a separate area, right? El okay. Elizabeth, what are some of the other stats and, and feedback that you've kind of, kind of gathered? Sure. Yeah, we got tons of data of, about consumers and their habits. And one of the really interesting things I think uh, is on that discovery side, consumers, 50% um, of them report enjoying browsing. Half okay. of consumers like to browse. And I'm actually one of those. I never feel like I know what to watch. So then I sit and browse. And that's usually actually what I do. I don't actually, actually I don't actually get to watching. I just browse and then my time's up and the kids are there. But that, you know, there's some nuances here in understanding these different consumers and the segments. And uh, most, 72% of consumers say they can find what they want to watch. 50% they, they say can they, or like, can't. They, they can. They, they can. They okay. are able to find what they want to watch. 50% enjoy browsing. 42% um, say they get frustrated. So you've got all sorts of different types of people, as Damien and all of you know, that you're trying to, you know, meet at where they're at. And sometimes that means that you, you know, to get to a specific set of consumers, you're, you're doing something differently. And there's no way to get to all of them with that little bit of difference there to capture them, especially on the niche services. If you're talking, you, you know, a million subscribers out of the whole population of the U.S., I mean, you're not going to everybody. You're, you're right. not looking for everybody. You don't even want everybody. So I think understanding, um, again, the movement between services, the hopping, the, the churn, that's something the industry has created, right? It's an it's a offshoot problem that was created by the ease of going in and out of services. So by solving one problem for the consumer of getting out of the cable channel, You've created a whole new problem, which is how do I keep them in when I made it so easy for them to hop around? And I think I said earlier on, on a call that 37% uh, of um, the, or eight, there's 8 million hoppers who have five or more services. You're constantly hopping. 8 million mm -hmm. people, that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. Do you really want to change that or do you want to embrace it and get them the next time they're hopping? You know, so it's it's got to be, I think, a changed mindset along with all the different change dynamics that have go on, gone on for the past few years and then had the pandemic. And, and, you know, it's all a catalyst for personalization, choice, low price points and that long term value that you're getting of the subscriber, which is why many are looking for the younger generations. You know, Disney wants to make sure their brand is imprinted on the five year olds, the eight year olds. So when they are 30 and older, that they will look to them as a, a core, you know, offering that a consumer might, might want to get. You know, now for the media companies, especially on this call, they're very focused and they have very specific kind of audiences for the most part. I'm not sure, Chris, whether to lump you in there, but, um, you know, right now, I think, do, are there questions you want to ask of each other, even though you may be even in a, you're competing possibly for somebody else's time, but you know, we're kind of in an environment where I want to be able to kind of generate interest in new ideas. So what kinds of things kind of off the top of your head are you guys thinking about or something that you would talk about if there's anything? And if not, I'll find something else to talk about. Well, uh, let, me, let, let me pose one up. Sure. Um, so first, first out, uh, there's a question out of, in the in the question box here from uh, a long time old colleague of mine, and Mark Nicano. Mark, great to great that you're watching today. Um, asking, are there plans to support security content encryption on fast platforms? Mm. Which is a great one out there. I'll throw it out to you. Uh, I'll throw that one at Chris. 
um, but uh, but also out to you uh, to, to to the panel. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Good question. All right, who's who's got an answer? Um, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Mark, I want to actually ask Mark, Mark, are you looking at saying, you know, are we going to be encrypting the ads as well as the content? Is that, is that what was coming out? Or Chris, yeah. you know, what's your insight there? No, I, I, it's, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not about the ads. <clears throat> um, I mean, yeah, there, there is, there's already, a, a, I, mean, I guess, at an industry level, there is a capability to, to support, you know, increased, um, encryption or or you know drm yeah. on a on a fast channel i know amagi does it for uh, for some partners um we don't we don't do it today it's something that we're that we're looking at um it's actually one of those things that sound mike's going to give me a, probably a better answer than i will but it sounds relatively straightforward we drm all our movies and tv show on a on a vod basis it's it's harder on on a fast channel basis uh, can get expensive, especially if you're encrypting it with DRM and something's playing out on a 24 seven stream. Um, but it's possible at industry level, it happens. I mean, historically though, one thing I'll point out is the content that was on a fast channel um, and Gene has a ton of this at, at, at Shout Factory, which by the way, we, we have a bunch of these great channels. You know, a lot of this content was, was deep enough in the catalog that DRM and encryption was less of a concern. Frankly, it was already available on, a, on a, a bunch of places already. And so it was more about monetizing it than it was about securing it. And this isn't about new release content. You're not going to get a new release movie on a fast channel. Um, but, you know, as, as these platforms prolif proliferate and as monetization improves and as customers come to it, you're going to see better and better and newer and newer content come to it, which will probably increase the need for you know, encryption on some level um, over time, because frankly, you know, the newer the content, the more valuable it is. And so that's probably a long answer for uh, for Mike to say, yes, it's really hard, but Margie can do it. Well, <laughs> what's interesting, just to kind of piggyback up that, we were just going through this at Reverie, going through our DRM protections because we're licensing big legacy backlog, you know, back catalog titles like Hedwig, or, you know, we're even talking to Warner Brothers about Glee. And it was really difficult to get through the fast DRM protection, super easy for the AVOD and the SVOD side. Um, we use Brightcove and we all for our direct to consumer and our VOD apps, and we use Frequency, sorry, Mike, and uh, Whirl as our playout tools, but both did actually have the capabilities to do it. It was just a really long process to get the approval from the studio to pass that DRM protection. Um, and it really has to be a title that is you know, brought to you by a studio or that has some kind of legacy to it or to Mike's point, um, you know, before where it's already been in the zeitgeist and been on free platforms like Pluto, like, you know, for instance, um, what you call it, uh, that's just out right now. Um, oh my God, I can't, I'm thinking of the movie, James Bond and the James Bond channel. <laughs> okay. One thing, one thing I'll add to that, and then I do want to hear Mike, Mike talk about this a little, especially since he threw me this one, is, um, it, it, it's actually uh, one of the difficulties is, is that actually you, you need for it to work on third party platforms like, like on Vizio Watch Free or, or Samsung um, Channel Plus. Um, uh, these services, you can't just encrypt the content because then you need the OEM to actually be able to, to authenticate that DRM on their side. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a much, it's a much bigger challenge than just can someone in you know, institute DRM inside of their app because that's only going to cover a fraction of, of the total consumption. So it's a much bigger problem across the industry than, than just can you wrap it in DRM. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pick up off that one, Chris, and, and just add into it that to, to do anything meaningful in the fast ecosystem, in the streaming TV ecosystem, requires aligning up a bunch of partners. And, and this, is the, this is one of the challenges um, it, uh, if you want to do something really cool and new with advertising in the space, you need to go out and line up probably five to seven major partners in different spaces in order to support that. If you want to bring in uh, security and encryption widely across the ecosystem, you've got to line up a whole bunch of partners um, through chains of supply chains of content creation, content provision, channel creation, channel playout. Uh, delivery out to a wide array of different video services where people can watch it. And then each of those video services has, has to 
opt into it. Um, and then all the different, you, you, you have rolling technical hurdles from there. Different browsers handle different types of encryption. Um, and so you, you, have to, you have to be able to line up these pieces in order to make this end-to-end -end decryption work. It's certainly not a, not a simple thing, even though we like to parry around, hey, you know, we, we support DRM in the ecosystem. We do as a Moggy, and then there's the caveat. But by the way, you have to line up 14 other partners in order to do it successfully end-to-end -end on every channel in every place that your viewer is going to watch it. All right, let's uh, move on to other questions. Now, originally when we were running this imaginary service, um, one of the things we needed to do was actually to let people find content. Is there ways that people are able to find things now that have changed, that have improved? Are there things you guys see in other areas where you think that would help people find their content? I'm going to pick oh, on Gene. <laughs> yeah, for us, you know, as more content gets out there, it's more cluttered. I mean, we had been relying on uh, using things like, you know, Johnny Carson, Carol Burnett, the, they're household names. So people, you know, as they're scrolling through a channel and they see a bunch of channels that they've never heard of, then they see the Johnny Carson channel and go, oh, I've heard of Johnny Carson. Here's something that I'll watch for a little while. Um, so we think that has done well for us, but um, but I think that time will probably pass pretty quickly. Uh, what we like to do is we like to create programming stunts, um, things that just makes the content buzzworthy. So uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, we're doing a Godzilla marathon. So we're putting that on both Shout Factory TV and, and Tokushoutsu. Um, you know, Godzilla has, you know, people have seen that many, many times. Uh, these are the classic films from 1974, or no, 54 to 74. So it's 15 of the classic films. Um, but we're creating an event out of it and we're hoping that that will get buzz among the Godzilla fans, uh, as well as other people who may be familiar with Godzilla, but just haven't seen those films yet. And, and now they're curious. Um, you know, that's, we think is better than just putting it up on a platform and hoping that people discover it. It sounds like um, Gene's going to help us run this imaginary channel and, uh, and, and Damien's going to kind of cross market for us. Right. So, so, you know, are you guys running each other's content by any chance? No, not with Reverie. No, okay. we, we are. Well, we're, we're, we're with, uh, we have Shout Factory content, Cynodyme content. We do not have Reverie yet, but I know, Damien, we've had some conversations. Had, yeah, it. it's really just been a matter of the legal teams. It's not, yeah. Okay, all right. Because obviously if you yeah, want to get the most viewers, you have to find other opportunities. And, um, you know, we're well, almost running out of time, but sorry, what, what were you no, saying? Just to add to that, and again, it's just to, you know, to give Chris credit, it's like not for lack of trying or wanting to, it's always just a matter of like capacity, you know, and like we're still in startup mode. We're, even though we're five years old, this year we launched six new platforms. Last year we launched 12. Next year we're gonna launch seven more platforms. Every year, there's going to be more third-party aggregators like Redbox and IMDb TV and Crackle who are going to either seek us out or we're already in negotiations with, and it's just a matter of like where we are in the queue. Mm -hmm. um, and that is essentially, if you're talking about like the imaginary kind of like, you know, fast channel A body OTT subscription, it's like you got to, the life cycle to have these type of deal flow is like a year. You know, it's like one year from the point that you actually talk to someone and say, hey, Chris, we want to be on Redbox, maybe even two years to the point where like you actually get launched and in market on their service. And so it's having that kind of constant deal flow in that life cycle going. Okay. And I, and I also want to raise one very important point too. you know, working with platforms like Redbox, yes, they carry our channels, but we create a lot of these stunts with their marketing efforts in mind, because what they want to do is they want to be able to showcase the content that they have on their platform to get uh, more viewers and also to get viewers to watch longer. So when we create these programs, we create assets and we create other um, tools that the platforms like Redbox can use to help promote our content on their platform. Okay. And, and sorry, one last thing, just to echo Gene, I think that's really important to understand is the marketing on third party 
-hmm. you know, in terms of your earned and your paid. It's, you know, again, like we're always talking to Roku Channel and Samsung TV Plus, their editorial teams for like different editorial moments like Pride season in June or National LGBTQ History Month in October, or we're coming up on Trans Day of Remembrance and trying to educate you guys on all the LGBTQ holidays. So we're constantly pitching content that has to do with editorial moments so we could get featured and we don't necessarily have to pay for that earn or that paid placement. But now what we're doing, because Amagi and Frequency and Zumo are aggregating so many thousands of channels or hundreds of channels, now that space is becoming very cluttered. So we have to have a healthy mix of paid. So we're actually spending money on each of the different platforms of third-party aggregators to have ourselves stand out when we're not getting that earned moment so we can compete uh, within that EPG. You know, we have a question from the audience that is similar kind of, but uh, the person asks, are VCs funding channels, brand studios? Who's funding smaller niche channels? Yeah, so I can give you a list. Obviously we've been <laughs> lucky. We've been very lucky because, you know, like I was saying, I'm one of four co-founders. My other three co-founders are two women of color uh, who one's a lesbian and army veteran. I'm an immigrant and identify as non-binary and Chris Rodriguez, who's Hispanic my now husband and fourth co-founder, so we kind of check all those boxes. But there are definitely VCs and angels that are standing behind diversity and minority built media businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to, you can ping me afterwards and I'm happy to share that list. Okay. Uh, the one thing I will echo, just FYI, is that the technology partners need to wake up and start to realize that you cannot, Amagi, charge us the same thing if you want to win me as a customer as someone like Cynodyne because the pockets and the con and the amount of every dollar that we actually can get uh, takes us five to ten, 10 times harder for someone who, you know, Cynodyne, which is run predominantly by um, a mainstream, you know, audience and panel of investors and has congratulations since been acquired. Okay. You know, um, I, I'd you know really love Mike to, to just, just, just dig into that one. If, uh, yeah. if you could there, Mike. The cost. I are you having can you have the incremental services available for customers who don't want to buy everything so so amagi is offers our services a la carte in, in a lot of different ways we're, we're able to customize our pricing quite effectively to, to meet clients needs um there's there's a there's a big span out there and I, again I, i'm the macro big picture guy so i, I look at this and go Collectively, across Amagi, across World, across Zumo, across whoever else is out here, uh, there's a lot of great companies in the, in the vendor space, in the tech space, power and screen TV. Um, the things that we're doing today, 10 years ago, would cost you hundreds of millions of dollars to do. And, and we're doing it for thousands of dollars a month. Um, th these are, these are the, the, the pricing differentials that bringing cloud tech, digital uh, the, the power of tech into this space and breaking it free has really changed the ROI in substantial ways. And uh, Amagi has, um, has, has built our tech from the ground up to be broadcast caliber, to be broadcast grade, and, and to focus on the things that make channels really great um, as they're going out to, to viewers. And these, these are the things that we bring into the market. And I, I think that we, we price them extremely reasonably for what we do. And I think to be fair to Mike is that you know, essentially, when people look at streaming, it looks dead simple, right? You're a viewer, you turn it on, it hopefully works. But that's not the way it is. And we all know that behind the scenes um, in, in terms of what somebody wants to do and what somebody can afford to do. There may be a difference, but that's also where some of this distribution comes in. We need to wrap it up. Is there closing thoughts you have? I'm going to kind of go around the circle and and just ask if there's anything else you would like to end your comments with and i'm going to go to daniel first since daniel is the closest to me on my screen daniel um, well i hope that damien gets to uh work out the business arrangements with uh chris and, and mike respectively <laughs> um, in addition to that i just so i just think like everything is super situational case by case basis in terms of like what's the right model who's the right audience what's the right content all of that and i think like it just it's just very very dependent um, on on the circumstances, um, but there's there's no right answer. I feel like a bunch of different models can work. 
Okay, absolutely. Jean, you know, your thoughts, you've, you've kind of got, I, I don't even know how to classify your, your span of stuff. Your thoughts? Oh, first thing I'm going to say is just uh, uh, quickly smile. So I'm going to take a screenshot of all of us. And, and, I'll send it, and I'll send it through to the group. <laughs> all right, so one, two, three. And um, yeah, it's Okay, you're doing selfies on the panel. I love it, okay, sorry. And, you know, it's gonna be an exciting time. So I don't, I don't really know, just, I, I think the big thing is just keep your options open. Okay. Um, things are gonna change. All right. Damien, without picking on Mike, what do you want? What, <laughs> what? Oh my God. I Mike and I haven't met yet. I feel bad. I'm putting him, I'm putting him on the spot. But I'm joking because I've had arguments with his CEO like multiple times. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I think the future is in, you know, I'm, you're going to hear me say this all the time. The future is a niche when you're building a brand to stand mm -hmm. out. And I think the future is in fast. And I'm going to stick to my opening point where it's generational. And when you look at the generations and where they're going and the sheer population of the generations, unfortunately, Gen Z is the largest on this planet. Okay. All right. Chris, what do you see for the future? Uh, yeah, great question. By the way, uh, uh, one, one, one note, we do work with Amagi. So for all the general ribbing I might give Mike, <laughs> Mark has been a partner of ours since we launched our ad supported services. So it goes a great clients, Chris. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, you know, I want to go all the way back to to what um, actually what Elizabeth was saying um, earlier in the in the conversation. I think it's still so early. You know, for all the size and and growth that we've seen, and um, frankly, the level of sophistication that that the markets developed, it's still early. There's there's still a ton of opportunity uh, in a variety of models. You know, what was it? Less than ten years ago, Netflix was 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 a DVD by mail business with a with an aspirational streaming company, or a side of it. You know, it, ten years from now, it's going to be fundamentally different again. And so, I, I I think it's not about one model winning. It's about, frankly, it's about customers getting the the opportunity to consume content how they want to consume it, okay. free, paid. Um, with or without ads, obviously, uh, sometimes fast, sometimes on demand, you know, all these things are going to continue to evolve. And, uh, you know, I think for, for anyone that's, that's either in the industry looking at it, I mean, what, what was maybe, you know, the, the biggest and most exciting news two years ago, you know, is going to be, you know, something you haven't even thought about two years from now is going to be big again. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for everyone to keep uh, building their services and keep evolving, you know, whatever it is or whatever business model that they're focused on. Okay. Elizabeth, you have something that you want to kind of wrap with? Uh, sure. And, you know, we love data at Parks Associates. So I will, I will end with a piece of data. Um, traditional pay TV subscribers pay an average of $85 a month. OTT subscribers pay an average of $90 a month. So the industry has successfully taken that average point and tipped it to OTT. So consumers are spending more on OTT than pay TV. Um, okay. It's a huge world out there and lots and lots of opportunities. So I, I really enjoy the invitation and I love listening to all these gentlemen um, talking about you know the hard work in, in retention and subscription and everything that it takes to make it happen. Okay, and apparently we want fries with that too. Mike, you've got the last word. What do you got to say? Thanks. You know, for uh, the, the streaming TV space is emerging. Chris nailed it on that. We're just getting going in this space and we, we see the outcome of V1, but there is a lot more to come. From the Amagi side, we're, we're committed to providing that toolkit. We are the tech platform that powers streaming TV and connecting channel owners with video services dynamically inserting ads into the, that stack, um, supporting all the different business models that are out there. Um, there is much, much to come just across this whole ecosystem. It fires me up every time I talk about it because this is such a dynamic emerging space. It's incredibly fun to be in. Okay. So. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. And Eric is back. I also want to say that if you want to see ad tech on Thursday, come to my next panel. Eric.
Thank you. All about, uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone. That was terrific. Uh, yes, all about ad tech, the future of ad tech on Thursday. I forget what time, but you know where to find it, I hope. Um, thanks again also to our sponsors, Conviva, Limelight Network, Signiant, Video Guys, and Amagi for sponsoring this panel. The winner of the Amazon gift card is Corey Sanders. So Corey, keep your eyes open for an email from us and come back in 30 minutes for the first innovation hour of the week featuring Millicast, Dolby, and Screen Media. Thanks again, y'all. Thank you. I want to see that selfie. <laughs> I, I emailed it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In this era of streaming video, we are pioneers, helping make your stories more vibrant. Conviva lives in billions of apps on devices all over the world, measuring trillions of data points each day to provide real-time insights for your content, ads, and social. Conviva. Every stream, every screen, every second. VideoGuys.com is your source for live production gear, and we can help you start streaming today. Reach a wider audience and tell your story using equipment like the RGB Link Mini Family of four HDMI mixers, YOLO Live YOLO Box, Olin One touchscreen mixers, streamers, and recorders, and PTZ cameras and controllers, perfect for productions of all sizes without a large production crew. Go to VideoGuys.com or call us at 800-323-2325 for help and start streaming today.